Welcome back to the fourth lecture of advanced dynamics. We're talking about single particles, and one big thing to note is, is that we're basically we're done with single particles with regard to Newton's second Newton's second law. Okay, so now we're going to talk about several particles, more than one uh, particle, two, maybe three, maybe fifteen, whatever. And we're talking about the dynamics, work, and energy of a system of particles as opposed to just one. We'll talk about uh, definitions for work, kinetic energy, and potential energy for systems with uh, this sort of situation as sort of precursors to talking about um, uh, Lagrange's equations and so forth for analytical dynamics a little bit later on. And we're going to talk about the momentum of impulse, impulse linear and angular, for a collection of particles as well, uh, just like we did for a single particle a moment ago. Now, in this case, since it's already kind of complicated by the fact that we have several particles, we're going to assume that the mass is, is constant with respect to time. So this m dot is going to always be equal to zero. That we're also going, what we're also going to do is we're going to say that this. Forgive me for a moment. Let me delete all that nonsense. We're going to say that uh, F sub I, capital F sub I, is the resultant of the external forces applied to the i particle. All right, so this capital F used to be, okay, we used to say that capital F is, is equal to the sum of the applied forces on, the, on one particular particle, but we're not going to do this anymore. We're going to say that F sub I, these are all the external forces. Okay, on the ice particle. So this I now represents the ice particle in a collection of many particles. And this F sub I J with a lowercase f is the force on the ice particle applied by the J particle. So we can have external forces and then we can have these internal forces. And the M sub I now is the mass of the ice particle. And we're going to say that's as well it's going to be constant. Furthermore, then R sub I is the absolute position vector of the ice particle. Absolute just means that it's with respect to a fixed coordinate system. We'll also say that there are n particles, and that we're going to assume that f sub i j is equal to minus f sub j i. That when you apply, when there's an internal force from the j particle on the i particle, f sub i j, that's equal to negative of the force applied on the j particle from the i particle. So there's equal and opposite forces between two particles. This is a really difficult thing to violate. All right, and this is true for all of the particles i and j, as they're counted over uh, all of the particles in our system. Newton's second law then says for each particle, in this particular case, we're saying that the ice particle, okay, for the ice particle, the mass of, the, of that particular particle times its acceleration is equal to the sum of the forces on that particular particle. So we have the external forces here, f sub i, and then we have all of the internal forces from the, all the other particles. J particles, um, and so then we end up with uh, n vector equations if we have n particles all together. So here we have n particles, right, all together, and for the ith particle we have the external forces, and then we have the forces due to all the other particles, well, one through n, all right, and um, for the whole system well, then we end up with n vector equations. Let's add them all up and see what we've got. So if we just add all the um, Newton's second laws for each of the particles, uh, if we add those all up together, then, then this is what we'd get. We get sum from 1 to n over i for uh, all the i particles, um, m sub i, r double dot sub i, so it's the mass times acceleration for the i particle over, uh, okay? And then on the right hand side, all the external forces on that i particle, and then all the internal forces on the i particle. So we have double summation here. And if we look at this, why don't we stretch this out and see what we've got. We've got, because you notice that what happens if, if I and J are equal to each other, we can't have a force applied from a particle onto the same particle. It doesn't make sense. So we know that at least some of these things will drop out to be zero. And then we know that if we switch I and J, then we have to put a minus sign in front because the force that's on the i particle from the j particle, that's equal to the negative of the force on the j particle from the i particle. So there might be some things we can, we can actually collapse out here. Let's take a look. Um, we've got 
we've got first off, we could we could write all these these self applied forces um in this way. We could say that I from one to N F sub I I, so that's F one one, F two two, F three three, F four four, yada yada yada, all the way down to F N N. Okay? And we know what that's gonna be. That's just gonna be equal to zero. And so then we've got F one two, F two one, F one three, F three one, so on and so forth. Okay, out to F one N plus F N one, F two one, F two all the way over until we get all the way down to F N minus one times N plus F N times N minus one. Notice what this one and this one, this one is equal to minus this one. This one is equal to minus this one. This one is equal to minus that one, and so on and so forth. That, if you look at it, actually everything all collapses out totally to zero. So this last term, all the internal forces sum out to be exactly zero. All we have left then is mass times acceleration. Um, if you look at the entire system all together, mass times acceleration summed all together over all the particles is just dependent upon the external forces. We don't have to worry about the internal forces because they cancel out. If we write the center of mass, if we define the center of mass, all right, the center of mass is defined as the sum of the, the masses times their, their position vectors divided by the sum of all the masses. So it's sort of like a running average or the centroid, all right? This, the position of the center of mass then, we write that as R sub C. Then if we say that um, this lower term here, we just write that with a big M saying, well, o overall, all the particles together, just cap M. Then we can say that the center of mass, this should be uh, subscript by the way, R sub, subscript I. R sub C, the center of mass is in just sum of uh, the mass times the individual position vectors um, over over I from one to N, uh, divided by the total mass of the bodies. So if we do that, then we notice that we can take a couple of, we can look at this, we can take a couple of time derivatives. R sub C double dot is equal to one over M times M sub I, R sub I, and where the, the I is summed from one to N. So in other words, the if you take the whole mass and you just concentrated the whole mass of all the little particles and placed them at the center of mass, then the whole mass times the center of mass is acceleration is equal to the sum of the masses times the, uh, the, the center of acceleration as well. Oops, and this is actually not correct. Let me fix this. This is summation of m sub i, r sub i, double dot from i from 1 to n. So the total mass of the system, time if, if it's placed at the center mass, that's just equal to the sum of each of these masses, okay, times their respective accelerations. In other words, if we look at back at equation 3, then you notice that this is equal to the sum of f sub i in uh, from 1. So this is the sum of all the external forces being applied to the system. So the total mass of the system times the acceleration of the center of mass is equal to the, the sum of the externally applied forces over all the particles. That's just, and we'll just write that as just F by itself. In other words, the sum of the all forces applied externally to all the particles is equal to the total mass of all the particles multiplied by the acceleration of the mass center. You can use this equation sometimes in helping you solve problems with multiple particles in ways that, that you might not expect. If we talk about linear impulse and momentum for a particle, we can talk about how do you actually perform an analysis um, using linear impulse and momentum. Um, if you draw the inertial coordinates and free body diagram of the particle, that's the first step in, in worrying about the linear impulse and momentum of a particular particle. And then the direction of the particle's inertial and final velocity should be indicated. Okay. And if we have an unknown vector, we'll assume that the directions of that of this uh, particle's uh, the direction lies in the positive sense with respect to the inertial coordinates. And then we can use the principle of linear momentum and impulse and note that all the forces applied to the particle will generate an impulse 
and that the forces as a function of time must be integrated. If you have constant forces, that's fine, but if you have forces that change over time, then you have to stick them in this, this integration and worry about the integration. For angular momentum, then you have to draw a free body diagram including in indicating the forces and velocity vectors. And, and the vectors need to be defined with respect to an absolute coordinate system. And you need to look for a setup that causes um, your point. If you're picking a point where you're having to find your angular momentum, if you can pick a point where the, um, you're defining everything with respect to and that happens to be fixed, that will make things easier. So look for a setup that causes your, your reference point B to be fixed. And you use the conservation of angular momentum and and see how you go. The principle of angular momentum of impulse is just m, m hat sub b, so the integration of m hat, uh, mb, I should say, and that's the rate change, that's the change from the momentum you had before to the momentum you have now. Newton's second law for several particles. If you draw a free body diagram for each body, in indicating, indicating the internal forces applied between the particles, external forces, velocity directions, and inertial coordinate system, that's a, that's a good first step to help you apply uh, Newton's second law, F equals ma, for each particle. And never forget this equation. Sometimes um, it will help get you out of trouble because you may not have enough equations if you just use F equals ma for each particle. You may need one more equation. You may have three unknowns and two equations. And this is your additional equation. Find then your absolute acceleration for each particle and use this A in F equals MA or R double dot C in F equals M R double dot C. And you can find R uh, double dot C from the center of, of mass calculation. So let's look at an example, linear impulse and momentum example in particular. We've got a 50 kilogram crate with an applied force P where it's P is equal to 20 times T and T is in seconds. And uh, it's in Newtons, all right? So there's a small problem when we're talking about Newtons. Um, this is not in italics. And then when we talk about normal force, it might be in italics. OK, so what we're looking for is a crate's velocity after two seconds. If the velocity of the crate at t equals 0 is 3 meters per second, notice that we've drawn e sub x down the plane. So it's 3 meters per second down the plane. And then the coefficient of friction is 0.3. Free body diagram is the first step in solving these kinds of problems uh, with using Newton's second law. Um, we have a normal force and with a vector here, and then we have the, the force P is being applied down down the plane, and then we have a friction force that's against it uh, going up the plane, right? And that friction force is equal to mu times the mag magnitude of n, and it's in the minus e sub x direction. Remember, if you have a vector in here, we have to look at the magnitude of it here with the vertical bars, and that's along the minus e sub x direction. So that takes care of our direction because this is a vector, and this takes care of our magnitude with the mu in there as well. And this should be newtons. There we go. Okay. So it's at 30 degrees, and the the, the weight of the box is a 50 newtons, or 50 kilogram box, I should say. All right. So we got the initial and final velocity as shown. Let's see what we've what we've got. So what we're looking for, actually we know what V1 is. V1 is our V naught, uh, which is three meters per second along E sub X. Okay? But we don't know what V2 is. That's actually what we're looking for in this particular problem. And I'm actually going to change this. So this is 50 newtons, and instead of being a 50 kilogram crate, forgive me, it's going to be a 50 newton crate. So now we're looking for V2. If you look at the impulse equation, we say that the impulse is equal to the, the integral of the forces from time equals zero to time equals at two seconds, okay, um, of all these forces integrated with respect to time. And that's equal to the mass times the change in velocity of from time equals zero to when it's at two seconds. Okay, so this is, these are all our applied forces. We have P and F, uh, F sub lowercase f plus n. 
and we have, um, these are all just the vector equations, right? And so we use the equation of equilibrium Newton's cycle law in the y direction. The sum of the forces uh, along the y direction is equal to n minus cosine of 30 degrees times 50 newtons. Well, in the y direction, if we've got our plane here, you got your box, and this is the x direction. What, what I'm going to do, if this is the x direction, this is the y direction, there's no motion of the box in the y direction. There's no acceleration either. So that means the sum of the forces is equal to zero in the y direction. So n minus cosine 30 degrees times 50 newtons, this is, this is our mg, is equal to zero. Then our n has to be 50 newtons cosine 30, or 43.3 newtons. So we found our n using that direction. And our friction force then is equal to 0.3 times our 43.3 newtons, or in other words, 13 newtons. So we've got a friction force, we've got the normal force, we've got everything found here, and we know what P is. It's 20T times um, 20T newtons. We have 13 newtons for friction force, 43.3 newtons for our normal force, and then we have our 25 uh, newtons and 43 newtons here from cosine 30 and sine 30 from the original um, force due to the weight of the box and that's equal to the, ma the mass times the velocity change. So we substitute it in for all our unknown variables. Okay, And if you combine these together, and notice that we only have to worry about the e sub x direction, that along perpendicular to the, to, the, to the plane and the sliding inclined plane, we don't have to worry about the e sub y direction. So we know what v naught is, that's 3 meters per second, and we can integrate this, and we end up with, then, we, and we know what the mass of the box is, so at the end of the day, what we end up with is 12.9 meters per second. Right. For an angular momentum uh, example, um, this should be angular impulse. Sorry, angular impulse and momentum example. It's a similar process, except we just have to pick a particular point where the mass is moving about. So we have a 0.8 Newton ball, B, that's attached to a cord passing through a hole in a table. When R is equal to, we'll call it R1, 1.75 meters, the velocity of the ball is 4 meters per second. A force F pulls the cord down through the hole at a constant velocity, V sub C, 6 meters per second. And what we're looking for is the speed of the ball when the cord is much shorter, about 0.6 meters later on, or R sub 2, is, we'll call that R is equal to R sub 2. So here's a drawing such as it is. We've got a force pulling the cord here through a hole in the table and this, this ball is going around around on this table and as force is being pulled the cord is getting shorter and shorter and shorter and so I guess we might expect the ball to speed up. So if the ball speeds up as it's getting shorter then we know that, that V2 which is what we don't know is going to be is going to be larger than v sub 1. So at least we know, have an idea of what's going to happen. But let's figure out what's happening. So this is an angular momentum problem, as I suggested. So let's look at a free body diagram. We've got um, force pulling inward. This is sort of like a central force problem. And then we've got the velocity of the ball over here uh, perpendicular to that. So if this radial direction is e sub r, and then we've got theta here as well, then at least our vector r is equal to uh, r, e sub r, and an initial state, this is r sub 1, and final state, this is r sub 2, but for the moment we'll not write it as either because we're just saying that that's just in general, and this is what we've got. And so let's look at our moment. Okay, so what point could we pick that would be good? We said we need to pick a fixed point, a point that's not moving for our reference point B, say. So let's pick the center here as our reference point B. And that point is never moving. Even as the ball goes around and does whatever it's doing, this point doesn't move. So this becomes our moment arm. So R, the vector R here becomes our moment arm. And then we have velocity. And we have mass times velocity. That's our linear momentum. Then this row across the linear momentum is our angular momentum. And then also we have a moment because of our F. And R, the row across F is our moment or our torque. And turns out, though, that f is always pointing towards O prime, or our point B as we've defined. So then our moment about this O prime, or B, is equal to R cross F 
and then that's r e sub r plus across to f minus e sub r, right? They're pointing along the same direction, right? So that's equal to zero. So there's there's actually no moment due to the central force about our point B. So the momentum should be constant. In other words, the momentum is conserved about this particular point. And furthermore, then uh, by defining R the way we've done, we've defined it with regard to a fixed point or an inertial point. So we have conservation of angular momentum we can use because this, this term here, R cross F, was equal to zero. And so the time derivative of the angular momentum is equal to zero, so it's equal to a constant. So our angular momentum initially, whatever it is, is the same as angular momentum at final time. The initial angular momentum is r cross p, where this is our moment arm, this is our linear momentum. And so that's r1 e sub r plus across mv1. Notice now what we're saying this is a particular time. So that's m mv1 r1. Notice that this is e sub r e sub theta, so r cross theta is z, right? Notice, notice that the e sub z direction is perpendicular to the plane of rotation. Then at the second time, well, we've got r cross p, r2, r2 e sub r cross mv2 e sub theta. That's mv sub 2 r sub 2 e sub z. Similar sort of situation. The one term we don't know is v sub 2, and that's actually the one that we're looking for. We said that these two are equal to each other, didn't we? Turns out then that R1 V1 is equal to R2 V2, and so then V2 is equal to V2 is equal to R1 V1 divided by R2. In other words, about 11.67 meters per second. As we guessed before, then the velocity, whenever this ball is closer in, should be higher than when the ball is, is farther out. Initially, the velocity of the ball is 4 meters per second, and when the cord is shorter, indeed, the velocity is higher, 11.67 meters per second. Problem of it is, is this velocity is only the velocity of the ball around the radial direction. Don't forget the fact that we have the, the ball, if you look at it from the top, the ball is moving in this direction at 11.67 meters per second, but it's also moving inwards because we're pulling it in. If if the ball wasn't moving around the disc at all, if it was just sitting there, if we pull the cord, it does have a velocity, doesn't it? It's moving towards this hole because of the cord pulling on it. And so as the cord pulls on it, we have another velocity here we have to think about. This is actually 6 meters per second inwards. So the, the true velocity of the ball is 13.1 meters per second. That's the square of 6 plus the square of 11.67 all with the square root. And it's because it's also moving inward. And keep that in mind. Or V1, right, is equal to the square root of that 6 squared plus four squared, isn't it? That's the total velocity of this particular ball when it's starting out. You notice that all we have to worry about in this case is the fact that the this velocity is in the circumferential direction, or the e theta direction. We do have an e sub r direction velocity as well. If we wrote this correctly, we could write this as m m v1 e theta plus uh, 6 meters per second e r with a minus sign, right? But notice this is e sub bar, and this is e sub bar. e sub bar cross e sub bar, that's going to be equal to zero. And so we don't have to worry about the inward motion of the ball when we're taking into consideration uh, the angular momentum because the cross product would cancel that effect out. The only time we have to worry about it is when we're talking about the total velocity of the ball. A very subtle thing, but it is important. So be careful about finding the absolute velocity. Last example is a bit more complicated. We have actually two particles here. We have a pendulum with a slider. So we've, what we've done is we've taken a regular pendulum and we've mounted it on a slider that can move back and forth horizontally. We've defined the, the horizontal motion one uh, with, with an x, and then we've defined this angle of this pendulum with respect to this mass m1. Uh, the pendulum itself has a bob mass m2, we define that as theta, 
gravity is pointing straight down. X is horizontal here as well as the coordinate system. Y is up. And then we've defined E sub R and E sub theta as uh, unit vector directions for this particular pendulum. What we're looking for is just the equation of motion. And it turns out that it's quite nonlinear. And again, you can get a numerical solution, but that's about it. Let's look at the free body diagram. First off, um, if you take a look at the, the, the block moving on the slider, well, we have applied force P. It's a bit small here, but it is the applied force P that we're putting in onto this, this top mass. So that might be the, the force that's actually causing the system to oscillate. And then we have a gravity um, that's pulling down on the mass. And then we have a normal force that's counteracting that. And then we have an internal force, F1, 2. That's uh, the force on body 1 as a consequence of uh, the presence of body 2. Well, that's being transmitted because of this arm. All right. So if we look at the, the pendulum bob itself, we have F12 in the opposite direction. In other words, it's F21. Notice that the vectors are in opposite directions. And there's a mass in 2. This is radial direction. And we have gravity of uh, uh, pulling down on the bob. And that's basically it for that particular system. So these Newton's second law, uh, some of the forces on the first mass, that's equal to P in the E sub X direction plus N along the Y direction. Okay, so this is the, the force causing the motion to occur. This is a normal force uh, holding up the, the thing on the rod. We've got M1G E sub Y. So that's, that's the force being applied uh, due to gravity. And then we have F1 to sine theta E sub X. That's the force on body one from uh, the second force in the F1 to cosine theta EY. And that's equal to M1 A1. And this A1 is just R1 double dot. That's acceleration. So these are some of the forces on the first body. And that's equal to the mass times its acceleration. Some of the forces on the second body, similar sort of deal. We've got gravity on that particular bob. And then we've got F12 cosine theta minus F12 sine theta. And notice the signs have been switched, but it's basically the same sort of appearance as we had for um, mass 1. Notice that, again, if we added these two equations together, that these terms would cancel out. That we'd expect. We'd expect when we look at the, the overall system that the internal forces will always cancel. So let's find what the accelerations are. R1 is equal to x e sub x. And so the acceleration uh, is a couple of derivatives of this. e sub x dot equal to 0. So then we have uh, acceleration is equal to x double dot e sub x. And R2 is a little more complicated because it actually goes out to where mass 1 is located and then the length of the bob itself, the arm, is B. And that's a long E sub R. And so if we take a time derivative of this, well, that's X dot E sub X. That's simple enough. But then we have to worry about B uh, times the time derivative of E sub R. It's E sub R dot because this, this particular coordinate doesn't stay in the same direction, does it? So we have a mega coordinate system cross the E sub R, or mega B with respect to A, whatever you'd like to write it as, cross E sub R. And we have to wonder what this term is going to be, a coordinate system change. Well, the only kind of change we can have is theta. And so the coordinate system rotation is theta dot. And if you do your right-handed rule, it turns out that theta dot here is it's increasing. Um, your thumb will point in the direction of positive z. So omega sub cs is positive theta dot e sub z. And so omega, omega sub cs cross e sub r is theta dot e sub theta. So r2 dot is x dot e sub x plus b theta dot e sub theta. In other words, they take another time derivative then, and we get x double dot e sub x plus b theta dot squared with a minus sign e sub r plus b theta double dot e sub theta. And if we expand all this out, my goodness, what a mess, because we have e sub r. We can write e sub r in terms of e sub x, and e sub theta in terms of e sub x and e sub y. And we end up with this rather long equation in terms of x and y. So a1 is equal to x double dot e sub x, and a2 is all of this along the e sub x direction, and all of that along the e sub y direction. We could also write A2 in terms of E sub R and E sub theta. It really doesn't matter. But the reason we wrote it in terms of E sub X and E sub Y is because we did it for the first mass and just make it look similar. All right. So for M2, the equation of motion is 
m two g cosine theta minus f one two e sub bar plus or minus m two g sine theta e sub theta, and which is equal to m two times x double dot sine theta minus b theta dot squared e sub bar plus x double dot cosine theta plus b theta double dot e sub theta, and then m sub one is as given here p plus f one two sine theta e sub x plus n minus m1 g minus f1 2 cosine theta e sub r is equal to m1 x double dot e sub x. And you could simplify these. You could substitute across and get rid of f1 2 and n because um, the normal forces you, you've got two a couple of unknowns and you can cancel things out a bit. Um, but that's really not necessary. Um, once you get to this point there's really not much you can do because this is super nonlinear. Notice that you've got a the theta dot squared, and at this point, really, you have to go to something like Mathematica to, to try to start solving this kind of a problem. All right, so that's the end of lecture four. I hope you enjoyed it, and um, hope you feel like you're learning something in here. Thanks.